The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village, and as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, first, let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Good morning. What folks out there can't see, but I can, is this is the closest we've had to a full church in a long time. And we have gathered here with a multitude of thoughts, concerns, observations, experiences, opinions. We are struggling with what it is to find the way of Christ in this moment and at this time. Would that I and we were so assiduous in the everyday as opposed to these days that we live in now. I look back to a time 30 years ago when I was asked by the rector who was my supervisor at the Church of the Ascension in New York City to preach on AIDS Awareness Sunday at a time when AIDS awareness was a whispered word when the men and people who were dying of AIDS were hidden in the back corners of hospitals and in wards, red doors sealed with tape. Much the same way that we experienced the pandemic, these souls were walled off from human contact in protection of others, not for themselves. I watched as week after week, not month after month or year after year, but week after week, funeral after funeral. People that I saw walking on the streets were no longer there. People that I saw in the pews left empty spaces. And the rector asked me to preach and I sat in front of my computer in those days, I was still writing scripts and I wrote seven sermons in four days and none of them were true or right. And I took them all to my supervisory session on Thursday when I would read that sermon to that priest who was supervising me. And I said, none of these are good. And he said, you're absolutely right. They stink. And then he gave me the greatest gift that I have strived to give to every preacher that I have been honored and blessed to mentor, which is I say, good luck, which is what he said to me. He didn't let me off the hook. I was still preaching. And I walked in with the best of a bad lot up to that pulpit. And I looked at that sermon and said, I can't preach this. I failed. And in that same way, I confess to you over 30 years later, and all of these experiences walking hand in hand with people for years and decades of pastoral care, watching and caring and loving people through all of the great struggles of their lives as they seek to be better human beings in a world that does not accept that struggle too often. And I still fail. I fail you today as a priest because I, I do not have a sermon clear in my heart or in my head. 
Because every time I start to think about what I will say or how I will preach or what I will speak, a face floats before me. Going back all the way to my childhood and watching person after person come to the Episcopal and Lutheran churches in our community seeking care because they were barred from other communities because of the choices they had made with regard to their health care. They were cast out and they were looking for a place to be received. And I was excited that my church could do that, but I also saw how my church had people in it that were deeply conflicted. And yet that church, like this church, has an open door. And that is the thing we practice and the thing we honor. We don't get to determine who it is that receives God's grace, forgiveness, and love. That is open to all. And our striving is to offer that safe space, that true space, that loving space to everyone, regardless of whether they cross the threshold or whether we have to go out and find them and remind them that God loves them, no matter what. I have seen that experience and that fright in people's eyes, whether they have been fleeing oppression from other states or whether they have been struggling with oppression in this one. I cannot count the number of souls that I have counseled and cared for and loved on your behalf as the church who have struggled to find their way in a broken world because of addiction, because of sickness, because of pain, because of excision from polite society. I was asked just this past week to describe my church. And I said, after over 260 years, after 12 years of service here, we finally have the right mission statement, which is welcome home, which sums up everything that we have been striving to practice all this time. And still the battle and the struggle and the wonder and the love are not concluded because we are always a work in progress. Just when we think we have it figured out on how to love 360 degrees, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, something happens that gives us an opportunity and challenges us to love in ways that were more radical, more profound, more affecting, and more transforming than we had anticipated just yesterday. This is what it means, as Paul lectures us, to never again submit to a yoke of slavery, but to accept the freedom that comes with the gospel of Christ. Teaching us that that freedom means nothing unless we care and love as deeply for our neighbors as we do for ourselves. I am angry and my heart is broken, but it is broken open because now we get the chance to love each other with the kind of radical abandon and blessing that Christ offers to us upon the way. We don't get to look back once we have set our hand to the plow. We don't get to say goodbye to those we love when we have committed ourselves to the way of justice and peace. We don't get the opportunity to say, this one is my neighbor and this one is not. They all are, and we are called to love them with abandon no matter what, no matter how profound and great the challenge, no matter how heartbreaking and triggering that is. I look around this room, this community, this church, this nation and this world, and I see people that I love with my whole being. And sometimes we agree, but always we love.
We strive for justice and peace, and we respect the dignity of every human being. These terms of our covenant and our baptism are not negotiable. They cannot be grayed out or in. They enliven us and quicken us and give us the realization that when we walk in this way and follow Christ, there is no compromise, but there is only radical and true and open love that will flow from us to the other without question and without abandon. Sometimes that means we raise our voices in protest. Always that means we raise our hearts to strive for liberation and peace. Never do we compromise the gospel that is of love and grace and forgiveness in Christ. I have failed as a priest and a leader of the church because I have not been able to make that stick and make it sure after 30 years. But I will never stop trying. Nor will we ever, ever close the doors of this church to anyone who seeks the life of Christ and to walk more profoundly in following Jesus to a closer relationship with God and with their neighbor. And we recognize everyone Every human being is our neighbor. And we will practice that love. Love for them, even as we hope to be loved ourselves this day and always. Amen.